Chapter 26, Philippians 4.13 Derek Wood had been a death squad soldier serving under Big Chuck for almost two years. In that span, he had trained relentlessly with his fellow soldiers in the jungles of South America and participated in a handful of operations against rivals to his boss's kingdom. In all of that time, he had never seen a single DS member lose their life. He had never witnessed a single mission end in failure. There were no accidents. No mistakes. Not even a sprained ankle is a penalty for their efforts. They were a true force to be feared. And now, all of that had changed. Word had spread through the ranks that Big Chuck had been attacked, by whom no one really knew. There were rumors, of course, but no official word had come down from on high as to who was responsible. Mason had been killed. Hudson and Ward had been captured. Club Escape had been attacked. A large portion of DS soldiers had been wiped out, as well as quite a few protection members of the club. Big Chuck's hired guns were dropping like flies at an unbelievable rate. Some of Derek's brothers-in-arms had already vanished into the night, choosing to flee instead of fight. It appeared that the once unbeatable supremacy of the Big Chuck empire was beginning to crumble. No one thing could last forever, Derek knew. The Nazis looked undefeatable once upon a time as well. But now, U.S. military bases dotted the German countryside and trained American soldiers on former Nazi soil. Before them, France ruled most of Europe under the military mastermind that was Napoleon. Until, of course, Duke Wellington ended his reign at the Battle of Waterloo. Before all of that, the Roman Empire controlled most of the known world. Until random, uncoordinated German tribes dismantled their authority piece by bloody piece. A kingdom was always a temporary thing. By the time it was all said and done, an empire was but an excerpt in the pages of history. Soldiers like Derek Wood either became a forgotten piece of that history or were smart enough to move on before that empire was erased and replaced. That is precisely what Derek planned on doing, moving on. And tonight was as good a time as any. In fact, tonight was the perfect time to leave considering both the weather he could use for cover and the distraction of Big Chuck focusing on being attacked. Slipping away should be easy. Before he was a foot soldier in Big Chuck's army, Derek was an up-and-coming officer in the highly respected Navy SEALs. He was a team leader with a list of accomplishments behind him and a bright future in front of him. Until, that is, he snapped while on assignment and decided to torture an eight-year-old boy in the Afghan mountains. He believed the kid could reveal the whereabouts of an elusive Taliban leader they had been pursuing for months. The terrorist had been single-handedly responsible for the deaths of many innocent Afghani civilians and a few American military members as well. Derek finally had enough and decided to fight fire with fire. He no longer cared how old someone was. Age did not define a soldier. If you fought against him and his brothers, you were the enemy no matter your age or your sex. His superiors did not agree with him. Torturing under the right conditions might be ignored or even covered up by the upper leadership, but removing the fingers from an eight-year-old boy with a pair of wire cutters was a line that could not be allowed to be crossed. When his actions were discovered, he was quietly retired from service. He would have ended up in a military prison had it not been for that same leadership wishing to avoid a scandal on every cable news channel. Out of the Navy, he was directionless and lost. He wandered from job to job and bar to bar until he stumbled into the receptive arms of the Big Chuck Empire. Here, he had found a home. Here, he could use his skills and training to make a lot of money. It would have been one thing if he was required to kill or harm innocent civilians, but he wasn't. He killed the scum of the earth. Rival drug dealers had high-level pimps dealing in sex slaves trafficked from faraway Asian countries, along with gangbangers, smugglers, thieves, and murderers. Every one of them was a lowlife who needed to be destroyed. True, it was a fact he made his living killing for the piece of dirt that was Big Chuck, but Derek justified it by proclaiming he was thinning the herd. Besides, you could never get rid of every piece of filth that roamed through society. No matter how many times you shook the sifting box of life, you would always find trash making its way to the top of the pile. For every five good people you discovered, there would always be one polluting the lot. Since he could not kill them all, he could at least take some of them out of the mix. 
and make a lot of money in the process. After all, it was the one thing he seemed to be good at, killing people. Because he was a realist and a former Navy officer, Derrick believed that being prepared for any eventuality was a smart way to live one's life. Preparation was an insurance policy against the possible. As such, he had been hoarding away his paycheck and living under very modest means, staying here at the keep that was Big Chuck's sprawling riverside compound of staying here at the keep that was Big Chuck's sprawling riverside compound of warehouses was like living in the barracks stateside or bunked in a ship on deployment when he was in the Navy. Except here, he had way more room and creature comforts than any one of them. He slept on a bunk in a corner, held little in the way of clothing and personal items, and fed himself from the leftovers of Big Chuck's kitchen. But there was also a makeshift weight room, a rec area with a giant TV and video games, a pool table, a full kitchen with two refrigerators, and even a stashed away gun range and weapons facility for training. He had everything he needed. Almost his entire paycheck over the course of the last two years was stashed away in a Cayman's Island bank account. He already had enough to live quite well for a long time. It was enough to even start a small business if he wanted. Now that was an idea. Maybe he could open a small bar on a beach somewhere and retire himself away to a less dangerous lifestyle. Derek had gathered his few possessions into a rugged backpack, collected his fake IDs and passports, and headed down by the riverside portion of the complex of warehouses. The entire place was wrapped in double barriers of chain-link fencing with razor wire at the top. It was guarded and secured from multiple locations and overwatched by a handful of snipers, concealed along roof lines, and strategically placed cameras. He was aware of a small blind spot, however, near where the fencing butted up against the river bank on the southern boundary to the keep. It was there that he would slip away under the cover of a heavy rainstorm that had set in. Tonight was the night. The timing was right, and concealment due to weather and darkness was ideal. He would kiss this life goodbye, slip away to the Caribbean to collect his money, and settle into a more relaxing and well-earned lifestyle. He made his way uneventfully to his planned exit point, and was in the process of doing a final scan of the area before rushing from his current hiding spot in the deep shadows of one of the many large metal buildings. That is when he noticed someone else had decided to use his exit point in the fence line but not as an exit, as an entrance. From his vantage point, he saw a shadow cross through the chain link and was now crouched down low in the heavy downpour. The figure, cloaked in darkness and rainstorm, seemed to be deciding on a way forward. The shadow made its decision then and bolted for the corner of a building. Not just any building, but the very one Derek now stood in the shadows of. Not just any corner, but the precise one he was now peeking around. The blackened form was headed right for him. Derek stayed motionless. He did not think the other could see him. He could try to duck back around and stay hidden, maybe avoiding the detection of the other, or he could use being concealed as an advantage and ambush the person headed his way. Derek chose the latter. It was his plan to flee the keep and Big Chuck, but he would not look a gift horse in the mouth. Whoever was sneaking in was obviously here to cause harm. Maybe he was an assassin. Maybe he was a spy seeking intel, working for whomever was assaulting Big Chuck. But regardless of the motivation of the approaching individual, Derek was going to take him out and maybe score a few more points with his boss before he left this life for good. Derek was armed, but his assigned silent service pistol was safely tucked away in his backpack, protected from the elements. He had not seen a reason for him to use it when he was preparing to leave, so he buried it deep in his bag with his meager belongings. The closest weapon for him to access was a single-edged combat knife strapped to his waist under his shirt. While he had been packing his gun away, he still hated not having something handy to defend himself with, so he tucked the knife into his waistband like it was a concealed handgun. Besides, he was as good with that knife as he was with a gun in his bag. For this ambush, however, he only needed his hands and feet. Derek was well trained in the art of hand-to-hand -hand combat. He timed himself accordingly, and at the right moment, stepped forwards toward the approaching figure and made a hard strike for his intended victim's throat. Derek was fast, always had been, and surprise was on his side to aid him. Add to the fact that he was shrouded in darkness and torrential rain, and he was nearly impossible for the other to detect and defend against. 
the unknown victim gliding his way through the downpour, would be easy pickings for a soldier of his deadly skill. Halfway to his target, chance intervened. Lightning broke the night, split through the rain and striking the top of a nearby building. The near-instant accompanying crack of thunder broke through the droning roar of rain on metal rooftops and pitted asphalt. The clap of thunder was like a cannon going off in his ears, and the blinding flash of lightning illuminated the entire area in a harsh white strobe. The thunder and lightning had two effects. For one, it startled both attacker and victim, breaking both of their concentrations and briefly disorienting them. For another, it ripped away the cover of concealment that both had been depending on to keep them hid. As a result, Derek was clearly revealed to the other as he made to incapacitate his intended victim. This caused the other to roll to his right in an effort to avoid him. What would have been a devastating blow ended up being nothing more than a glancing strike across the shoulder. Even though the flash of light lasted but a moment, its illuminating effects were carried over to a nearby transformer, exploding in an identical crash of noise and blinding flash. The shattered transformer still had the sustained voltage of electricity coursing through it, and it instantly caught fire, casting a strobing, flickering, and sustained light across the surrounding area. While Derek was not armed, the other certainly was. Two silenced pistols were strapped low to each one of the stranger's leg and matching combat holsters. As the other pivoted to one side, he simultaneously made to draw one of them with his right hand. As he cleared the holster, Derek timed a second open palm strike at the wrist, across his own body. And this time his aim was true. The shock from his hard impact caused the man to release his grip on the weapon, and it careened away across the wet pavement. The man continued to roll and pivot further to his right, and this time he grabbed for the other gun with his left hand. Derek countered with a second strike with his other hand, and again his aim was true. The second weapon was released to harmlessly clatter to the ground. Now they were on even footing. Neither had a gun to bring to bear on the other. It was hand-to-hand -hand combat all the way. Derek had no idea on the history of the other, but it was clear from his rather clumsy nature at trying to move away, he had no training to speak of. Derek, on the other hand, had years of aggressive training and practical knowledge at his disposal. He almost felt sorry for the other. This was going to be too easy. His target was wearing a bulletproof vest pulled over the top of a t-shirt. It would offer insulation from any body blow he might throw at the guy. He would have to choose another area to aim at. Thankfully, the guy had many to choose from. Arms, legs, joints, head. He advanced a step. The other fell back one. The pulsating light of the damaged transformer allowed Derek to see the uncertainty in the other's eyes. Derek took advantage of that in an explosive set of rapid steps forward, his victim hastily falling back away from him in the process. Then, Derek went leaping into a spinning attack, known in Taekwondo as a tornado kick. The stranger made to block by bringing up an arm against Derek's furious assault. It was a futile and inexperienced effort. The toe of Derek's boot smashed through the other's defensive move and connected near the guy's left ear. And just like that, the fight was over. The invader spun around from the impact and landed sprawling on his stomach with a splash and a groan into the rain-soaked pavement. And now, Derek asked himself, do I bring the guy in alive? Or do I slice his throat and drag his corpse back to Big Chuck? He liked the sound of the last option the best. He moved forward and straddled the dazed form one foot on each side of his collapsed victim. He reached down and grabbed a handful of hair and pulled his head back hard, exposing his throat. Derek gripped a large knife concealed beneath his shirt and released it from its scabbard. His victim offered no resistance, dazed from his wicked blow. It was not an unfamiliar position he now found himself in, standing over a fallen adversary he was about to slice from ear to ear. It was a move he had repeated throughout his murderous career. Perhaps this would be his last kill before officially retiring, he mused. How fitting. A final extinguishing of life on his final night of service. As if on cue, the sparking and burning transformer issued its last sputtering arc of light, and rain killed the flames. The area was plunged back into wet, thundering darkness. Derek smiled at the symbolism, and then directed the sharp blade downwards towards his victim's throat. Chapter Break Perspective change. DJ thought it a stroke of luck to have found a break in the double barrier fencing. Searching the nearby rooftops showed no signs of movement, and the two cameras he spotted were aimed in another direction. 
He used the weak spot to slip through undetected, or so he thought, and head for the shelter of one of the many warehouses. He needed to get out of the rain so he could fish out the phone and use the app to zero in on the exact location of Big Chuck in this unyielding rat maze of buildings. He decided to assault Big Chuck's warehouse fortress by staying as quiet as possible. So, he only carried his twin silent SIGs. He chose to leave behind the other long guns in the SUV, as they would make too much noise. Right now, with the heavy rain pounding every exposed surface and the sporadic crack of thunder, there was enough noise to camouflage any silent shots he might choose to take. He might make it all the way to Big Chuck before anyone became aware of his presence. The odds of that were probably nil, but one could always hope. Besides, he brought quite a lot to this fight despite only packing two handguns. Not only had he collected nine extra mags from both pistols, totaling 173 rounds with what was still left in the matching gun strapped to his legs, but he possessed serious skill in wielding them. He felt sorry for anybody that ended up in his way. And with his recent successes, he was feeling extremely confident in his ability to pull all of this off. He was sprinting for one of the outlying buildings when a real stroke of luck occurred. Lightning struck a nearby rooftop, and the flash of light illuminated a previously undetected attacker, slipping through the blackened rain to level a crippling blow at his head. He only narrowly avoided it, the punch grazing his shoulder instead. The lightning caused an electrical transformer mounted high on a pole nearby to explode with more flashing light and noise. It continued to pop and spark and set the pole it was attached to on fire, the creosote fueling the small blaze despite being soaked by rain. The flickering light served to bathe the combat area he now found himself in with dancing, popping, sizzling illumination. He moved to one side and quickly drew his main hand weapon. The other was simply too fast, however, and DJ had largely been unprepared. The guy pulled a ninja move and struck DJ's gun hand with his palm. The blow sent the pistol spinning into the night and left his fingers numb and tingling. Fine, DJ thought to himself. That's why I ascribe to the belief that there is no such thing as too many guns. He made to draw his offhand weapon, but again, the other proved simply too fast. Another ninja-like strike sent the second weapon away from him as well. Now he was in real trouble. For the first time in this short fight, fear raced up his spine. DJ was well-versed with just about anything that launched projectiles at high rates of speed. He was both fast and accurate with just about any gun he could get his hands on, but he simply didn't know jack about hand-to-hand -hand combat. Oh, sure, he had been in a handful of fights over the course of his life, and he had won his fair share of them. But artful and skilled, he was not. He was more of a, a brawler, a type of fighter who just simply balled up their fist and waited in swinging without too much thought or planning. The way he had been disarmed without much effort at all showed that the one he now faced clearly outmatched him on every level. Yes, he was in very real trouble. His adversary took a step towards him, DJ retreated backwards with a step of his own. Suddenly, his opponent was charging forward. DJ found himself clumsily scurrying backward, sloshing across the rain-laden asphalt, desperately trying to stay away from the attack. Then, like a gymnast, the other was leaping and spinning in the air. He was a flurry of arms and legs. Too late, DJ realized a kick was being propelled towards his head, and he frantically tried to block it with his left arm. He failed miserably, and the toe of a laced-up boot crashed into the side of his head above his ear. DJ was sent sprawling and spinning across the wet pavement. Stars crossed his vision, and he felt like he was going to black out. There was a ringing in his ears, and he was uncertain if it was because of another crash of thunder going off impossibly close, or if the guy had kicked him so hard it had damaged his hearing. A ringing in his ears could also be a sign of a concussion, he thought to himself. Great. Not again. He struggled to push himself up from the ground, but none of his muscles seemed to be working right. The side of his skull throbbed with shooting pain, and it made his other head wound above his eye start aching all over again. The puddle he was laying in was turning red beneath his gaze. He was bleeding once more. More than likely the blow had reopened the wound, and with the bandage soaked from all the rain, it was now useless, if it was even still there at all. He noticed he was gasping for breath. The wind had been knocked from him but he had been hit so hard, he wasn't thinking clearly. He was living in a fog. His brain had only now just informed him that he was having issues getting oxygen into his lungs. He was in trouble. He needed to get up. He needed to move. He was losing this fight. 
His assailant grabbed a handful of hair from somewhere above him. The man jerked it hard, and DJ's head arced backwards, exposing his neck. Oh no, he screamed silently in his own head. No! He knew what was coming next. There was only one reason to yank his head back like this. The man behind him must have a knife. He was going to cut his throat. DJ was going to die here in the rain, on the ground, head pulled back like he was some helpless animal about to be sacrificed to a pagan god. It was over. All of his recent successes in his battle against Big Chuck were about to result in nothing, and not even killed at the hands of the one man he sought to finally confront. He would be killed instead by an unknown stranger who didn't even weld a gun. A gun. If only, if only he still had a gun, any gun, he would even take a small one. His rattled brain finally connected his memory of the recent past to a situation in the present. Back at Abby's house, the attack on them led by a traitorous FBI agent. Abby had beaten the guy senseless. DJ rounded the corner to see the guy about to shoot Abby in the back with a smaller backup pistol, a Glock G26. DJ had ended him and then confiscated the man's weapon for his own. It was now still stashed away in his waistband, under his shirt and vest. The flickering light of the transform and the flames of the burning electrical pole finally gave up their last bit of illumination. Electricity ceased coursing through the damaged transformer, and the rain finally beat back the flames clinging to the pole. The cover of night was yanked back over the area once more. Everything went black, but only for a moment. DJ snatched the Glock from his waist, swung it around behind him until he felt the barrel connect with a body part of the man standing over him. A foot, he thought. He pulled the trigger. Twice. Twin flashes of light shattered the darkness and the man above him screamed. DJ was suddenly released. He twisted hard to his left, rotating onto his back, but still lying between his assailant's feet. He could not see the enemy above him, but he really didn't need to. A guess would be good enough. He aimed in a general direction and pulled the trigger again. Another flash of light, and DJ could clearly see the precise location of his attacker straddling over him. In that split second, he could also see the man's face. It was twisted in both sudden pain and complete shock at having the situation reversed on him so quickly. The man disappeared back into the shadows of night. DJ aimed at where he remembered the guy's face to be and pulled the trigger a fourth time. The resulting flash of gunpowder burning away outside the confines of the barrel of his gun gave DJ the rewarding view of the man's right eye being turned into an unseeing hole as a round traveled upwards through his brain. The full weight of his dead enemy collapsed on DJ then. He did not move. He just lay there with a dead body on top of him, the man's lifeblood pouring itself out on him, combining with the unrelenting rain. Heavy drops of water drove downward into his face, as he gasped for breath. He closed his eyes from the onslaught and thanked whomever might still be listening above for helping him through one more impossible battle. Just a battle, however. Hardly the completion of a war. In order for all of this to finally be over, he must catch his breath, pull himself up from the ground, and press on to the finish line. That thought caused him to remember a sermon preached by his former pastor back in Oklahoma a scripture from Philippians, a verse written by the Apostle Paul to motivate believers, something about pressing on towards the goal to win the prize. In that lesson, the preacher had explained it was not important how you cross the line, that in this race, just to make it to the finish meant you were a winner. Stumble, trip, or stagger your way across the line, and you collected the prize. In that particular instance, his pastor had been talking about living a godly life in a broken world, but DJ used it now as a means to motivate him in the quest he was now on. Get to the end of this thing, he told himself. Just get to the end. Be battered, bruised, and bloody, but just cross the finish line. DJ let the small glock fall from his fingers as he rested for a moment more. He would collect it in a minute, and he would tuck it back under his shirt and vest for backup. It still had six rounds. This time, he told himself, he would not forget it was there. For now, however, he just needed to rest a minute more. He let the cascading water wash over him. In his mind, it was a symbolic act of letting the rain cleanse him from his worries and concern. He let it wash away his physical and mental stress. He let it restore him. He let it mend him enough that he could press on towards the goal and the prize. Finally, after a long moment more, 
he pushed the dead body off of him. He found the small backup pistol in the dark and wet, returned it to his waistband, and willed himself to stand again. He was rewarded for his effort with a fresh pounding above his eye as his gunshot wound reminded him that it was still there. He groaned aloud and bent over for a moment at the waist, resting his hands on his knees for support. Beaten and battered, he thought to himself, but I press on towards the prize. He took a breath and forced himself to straighten. For a moment, his vision tunneled and faded, and he thought he might pass out. But then it passed, and he was fine, except for the aching throb above his right eye. He began to kick around the wet pavement until he located the dead man's knife. He picked it up, then crouched over the corpse. Using the blade, he began to carefully trim away a section of the man's shirt, creating a two-inch wide long swath of cloth. He then used that like a headband and looped it around above his ears and eyes and secured it behind him. He was careful to cover his head wound and ensure the flap of skin stayed closed. The body was an amazing thing, he knew. It had a persistent habit of knitting itself back together, all on its own, particularly when it came to skin. Practitioners of medicine and first aid always stapled or sutured skin closed whenever possible, but that was only to ensure the wound did not reopen and minimize scarring. As long as skin touched skin and that connection was maintained, the body would usually seal itself back up if left alone long enough. Once completed, he then removed the man's backpack and slung one strap over his shoulder. He searched the man's pants and found a wallet and confiscated it as well. A few minutes more feeling around the rain, and he was able to locate all of his lost pistols and return them to the resting places about his body. With that, he made his way to the closest building, trying the first door he came to. Locked. He proceeded along the way until he discovered the next door. Again, he found it to be locked. He moved to the building across a narrow alley. He could see another door centered beneath a small overhang. As he grabbed the knob, the door opened on its own, driven wide by another soldier. That was what DJ was calling them now. Soldiers, after all the role and function, seemed to be one and the same. And this certainly seemed like a war that they were all participating in. The enemy soldier that darkened the doorway was certainly surprised to meet up face to face with someone else. And that surprise was his undoing. DJ drew with his left hand. He fired once from the hip straight into the guy's middle, and the other twitched from the impact. With DJ's right hand, he grabbed a handful of the combat vest the other was wearing to secure him in place. He then raised his weapon to the other's forehead and pulled the trigger again. The man dropped where he stood, and DJ, without remorse, calmly stepped over the corpse. The whole encounter had lasted less than two seconds. Eleven rounds in his left-hand weapon, seven in his right. DJ stepped to one side to make sure he was not silhouetted in the door from the glow of lightning that continued to arc through the sky. He listened, gun ready in the black shelter of the building. His ears searched the surrounding area, seeking signs of life and movement, looking for the man's friends. The only thing that could be heard was the pounding of rain on the aluminum roof, interrupted by sporadic cracks of thunder. He holstered and grabbed the back of the vest of the guy lying in the doorway. He dragged the body the rest of the way in, and closed the door. Again, he paused to listen. Nothing but the roar of rain on the roof. He fished around in his pocket and pulled out his cell phone. It was soaking wet, but it still fired up when DJ stabbed the home button on the surface. Small blessings, he thought to himself. He was certain the thing would be waterlogged and dead. Using the glow of the screen, he began to check things out. The first thing he did was open his new backpack and explore the contents. The backpack was fashioned out of a heavy waxed canvas, so all of the contents were nice and dry. He found a few changes of clothes. Since the dead man was about his size and DJ was going to need a fresh set of clothing when he got out of here, if he got out of here, he decided to keep them. He also found a shaving kit with disposable razors. He briefly thought about Abby and decided this might be a sign. He would shave before he saw her again, if he saw her again. Stop that. Press on towards the goal and the prize. Don't be a Debbie Downer, he fussed at himself. He found a small tactical flashlight and pressed the button on the base to switch it on. A harsh but tight white light stabbed through the gloom. From being in absolute darkness for so long, the light was like the glowing finger of God showing up to illuminate his surroundings. He found a smaller button along the side and pressed it. The light changed in intensity and went dimmer. He tapped it again and it went dimmer still. A third press and it dropped to very dim. 
more like a map reading light for land navigation, something that would allow you to read a piece of paper but not destroy your night vision. He left it there and continued to inventory the bag. Socks, a small folding knife, a Sig Sauer handgun with a silencer identical to the two he had strapped to his legs. Then he discovered something unique. Three different sets of identifications bundled separately with rubber bands. Each bundle contained a passport, driver's license, and social security card in a plastic waterproof sleeve. Opening them up showed different names, but all the same picture. DJ blinked at the image. He smiled at his sudden discovered fortune. If DJ cleaned himself up, he could easily pass for the man in the photos. He laughed out loud. Are you kidding me? But then it only got better. Wrapped up in a self-sealed plastic sandwich bag, he found a bank passbook. It identified a bank on the island of Grand Cayman in the town of Georgetown. It included a long series of numbers marked as the account number, with a total balance as of three months ago of $1,383,653. And to even make it better, the stupid guy had written an eight-digit passcode into the margins and faded ink so as not to forget it. The name on the passbook matched one of the names from the stack of identifications and passports he found. He could walk away right now and start a new life. He could scoop up Abby and vanish into the tropical paradise of the Caribbean and leave all of this behind him. He shook his head and stopped himself. First of all, he could not presume to know who Abby was, and if they really could have any kind of future together. Shame on himself for even considering something like that. Shame on himself for leaping away from the memory of his dead wife and children so quickly. Was he really so willing to grasp onto a fantasy of imagined happiness and just abandon the memory of his wife? Were Cassie and the girls not worthy of the honor of having their memory carried with him in grief to his dying breath? The other side of his conscience spoke up and asked, but at what cost? Was he not entitled to rediscover happiness and joy? Was he not entitled to find peace and companionship? Would Cassie not want him to eventually move on? Of course she would, he corrected himself, but first things first. He snapped himself out of his thinking and continued his exploration. In the wallet he found was another driver's license with yet another name, Derek Wood. He also found $353 in cash and two credit cards. He dropped the waterlogged wallet into the bag along with the dead man's knife and closed it all back up. Next, he removed to the other corpse and removed the combat vest and attached radio with earpiece. It was much like the others he found on the soldiers back during his fight at the canyon. There was also another matching pistol on a cross-draw holster meant for a lefty, so he switched it around. It contained a full mag, and that left him with three silenced handguns and a stockpile of ammunition. Along with the vest and handgun, the soldier also had another M4 rifle slung over his back, loaded with a full 30-round magazine. Three more magazines for the rifle, and three more for the handgun were outfitted on the vest to one side. That brought his ammunition count to 239 rounds for his four pistols, and 120 rounds for the silenced rifle. He was as prepared for a combat mission as anyone ever could be. He was sure he looked absolutely ridiculous standing here in the darkness. He had two silenced handguns strapped low to his legs in combat holsters, a bulletproof vest underneath the combat vest, and another pistol and a cross-draw holster on his chest. A large combat knife now tucked behind him in a scabbard, and a concealed smaller handgun with six rounds for an emergency underneath all of that near his navel. Plus, he was equipped with a silenced rifle with a full complement of magazines now at his beck and call. He had a military-looking backpack, strapped behind him, and a radio plugged into his ear. There were countless handgun magazines stuffed everywhere. To top it all off, he had a Hollywood headband to complete the ensemble. Ridiculous. It would slow him down a bit as far as running was concerned, but what he lacked in mobility, he more than made up for in protection and guns and ammo. Besides, if anyone he should happen across was prone to be intimidated by an imposing presence, he had that in spades. He brought the phone out and fired up the app that would show him the exact location of Big Chuck in the midst of all these buildings and warehouses. He pinpointed the mob boss quickly and planned a route out in his brain that would snake him through to his goal. It was then that he remembered the exact scripture reference from his pastor's sermon so long ago. Philippians 4.13 I press on towards the goal to win the prize 
DJ said aloud in the damp darkness. He was pretty sure there was more to it, but that's all he could remember. He opened the door to the warehouse. Lightning briefly silhouetted his form in the doorway, and then he vanished to become one with the night. <laughs>